We worship poorly on Sunday because we worship poorly Monday through Saturday. Psalm 78, hear God's word. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling the de generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he has established a testimony in Jacob. He has appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, they were armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come into your presence today asking for your help. We want to see a home where worship happens, Father, a home that brings glory to your son Jesus. And so we pray today, God, that you would take all the distractions, all the things that are competing for our minds and our hearts and our affections, and God, you would remove them right now. Oh, Lord, that you would still us so that we could hear your voice and know the solemn responsibility, but also the great privilege of having a home where worship happens, where seeing you as Lord Monday through Saturday is a reality and a joy for your people. Oh, Lord, I ask for your help that we would consider the past, but we would also know the future. And you would be greatly glorified in this house today as we hear your voice in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Psalm 78 is what is often called a historical psalm. The author, whose name is Asaph, is recounting the history of Israel. And he's probably writing after the nation split in two, after the time of David and Solomon, and there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And as he's writing, he's writing with a very, very closed and very powerful purpose. There's not a lot of room, wiggle room here with this text. He's trying to make a very strong point, and he makes it very clear in the preface in the first few verses of this psalm. Now, it's a very long psalm, 72 verses, and we just want to take a few minutes and look at the first 11 as our launching point to see what God would say to his people and for us to learn from the past so our future is right. Now, friends, this was written as a warning. This is a warning against the danger of what is called apostasy. Now, you may not be familiar with the word apostasy and what that means. It literally is defined as an abandonment of what you once professed, a desertion or a departure from what you once believed, from what you once had faith in. So as we look at the introduction, the psalmist says these words, Give ear, my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and utter the dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and notice our fathers have told us. This is an address. Asaph is speaking as a leader of the people. He's speaking to the nation that has divided, that has been through so much, and he is authoritatively speaking as law, calling their attention to something they must not miss. He says, incline your ears. This is worthy of your regard today. You do not want to miss these words. I'm going to speak to you things of old, parables, wise sayings that the fathers have spoken. Now, I know what happens in 2014 when we hear about parables of old and words of old. We kind of roll our eyes because we live in a generation where new is better. 
Everything always has to be new to be helpful and contemporary. It's like, you know, flip phones versus smartphones, right? No one wants a flip phone anymore, right? Uh, we want the smartphone because a flip phone, well, unless um, maybe you're over the age of 65, um, then the flip phone is definitely what you want, right? Is that true? Yes. But most people, they want the new, the new, the new. And when you read this here, sayings of old, you might put a flag up in your mind and say, I would like the new. But I want you to understand, as one writer has said about things of old, old wood is best to burn. Old books are best to read, and old friends are best to trust. And when it comes to spiritual things, we don't want new things. We want what God has always been doing. We don't reinvent God's wheel. You can't do that. He is God. He is Lord. Instead, we follow Christ and what he has said and what he has done. Now, in verse 4, this is a message that we should not forget. In fact, it should be given to future generations. How do we do this? How do we pass it on from one generation to another? Well, two ways, the verse says. Number one, we hide nothing from them. We tell them the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, our successes and our failures. We hide nothing from them, and we declare everything God has done. Let me ask you, if you are a second-generation believer, meaning you're someone who had parents who were Christians, if you were blessed to, to have that kind of a background, can you tell stories of the faith of your parents? Can you tell things that God did in your family through your parents if you were blessed to have believing parents? You should be able to if your parents were walking with the Lord. And yet we find that there's a lot of generations that come and they go and they have absolutely nothing to say. They are agnostic when it comes to God and the parents' relationship with God. This is a heartbreaking thing, is it not? In fact, when we read here, they should declare everything God has done. I'm reminded of what Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry said, be not afraid of saying too much in the praises of God. All the danger is of saying too little. And I fear many of us have fallen into that danger that we hardly skim the surface of what God has done in our homes, in our lives, in our hearts, in our families. And we have a solemn responsibility before God. In fact, it says, declare the praises of the Lord, who he is, what he has done, his strength, the ways he has intervened in your life. And maybe some of you today, you're, you're seeking and you're here and you're not a, a Christian but you're interested and you haven't seen him work yet and you don't understand what this means, I want you to know that when you have Christ as Lord of your life, God's hand is upon you. His strength is over you and he does amazing things in a believer's life. Wonderful things he has done. Who is God to you and what has God done in you and through you? These are the things we're supposed to pass down. In fact, verse 5 it says that there was a testimony in Jacob. Now, we know what a testimony is. It's your story. It's who you are, what you've been through, what God has done in your life through Jesus Christ. Every Christian has a testimony. Let me say that again. Every born-again, Jesus-saved Christian has a testimony, right? You have a story of what God has done inside of you. And the command in verse 5 is, he commanded our fathers to pass this testimony on. This is a solemn charge to every parent, to everyone who is a leader in the home, to pass on what God has done for the benefit of distant generations. Charles Spurgeon once very wisely said, ministers and Sabbath school teachers, or in the modern day, ministers and community groups were never meant to be substitutes for a mother's tears and a father's prayers. We have been so, as a society, so content in letting other people worry about our children that we have forgotten where the solemn charge is to be found. Children only tend to take the Bible and the Lord as seriously as their parents do. Now, that can either be a very freeing statement or a very dangerous statement to our hearts and souls today, can it? Let me say it again. Children tend to only take the Bible as seriously as their fathers do. Now, we have many commands in the Bible. Parents who are in the room today, and this message is not just for parents. There's going to be something for everybody here, but I want to start there. Parents, there are many charges in the Bible that give this solemn command to you. And look, if you're a grown parent, meaning your kids are now adults and they're big kids, they're not little ones anymore, 
You can't change the past, but you can invest in the future, right? And so while maybe you weren't a believer in the past and you did not do this, it's still not too late if your child's still in this world. So, so listen to what Deuteronomy 6 says, just one passage. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and even when you rise. You say, Pastor, why is it so important for a father, for a mother, to invest in their children spiritually? I mean, we get investing them in other ways, education and sports and all these things. We get that, but why should we invest in them spiritually? Well, verse 7 tells us why. Look what it says there. That they may set their hope in God. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers before them, a stubborn and re rebellious generation that did not set their hearts right, whose spirit was not faithful to God. When it says that they might have their hope in God, it means that they would be worshipers of God. To have hope in God is to be a worshiper of God, to know who God is, to know who you are, and to follow him because of it, to praise him because of it, to love him because of it. See, the psalmist says, we want our children, we want the next generation to have their confidence in God, allegiance in his leadership, not to trust in idols and false gods, but in the living God who loves them and gave his all for them. Spurgeon has said here, the best education is education in the best of things. The first lesson for a child should be concerning his mother's God. Teach him what you will, but if he does not learn the fear of the Lord, he will perish for the lack of knowledge. How many of us send our kids to school eight hours a day for their benefit? Yet scripture is clear. The first chapter of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. You can give them the greatest education in terms of book knowledge ever, but if they do not have the fear of the Lord as the beginning of their wisdom, it is all in vain. Because they'll be looking at it with the wrong lenses. And they'll misunderstand the knowledge and misuse the knowledge that they have been given. My friends, the danger is, verse 8, if we do not do this, they will be like their fathers, the previous generations, the ones that split Israel in half. What a terrible day that the nation of Israel was split in two, Judah in the south and the northern tribes in, uh, above them. How terrible it was that a nation, brothers and sisters, fought against each other, a civil war, a competition against those who were supposed to be one under God. My friends, it was because... They did not pass on the things of God. They did not worship past the tabernacle. They did not worship past the feast days. They did not pass on what God had given them to the next generation. You see the word stubbornness, and often we confuse the word stubbornness and steadfastness. And I want to tell you, there's a big difference between the two, right? Anyone who has a three-year-old knows the difference between stubbornness and steadfastness, right? Thank you. Think about this for a minute. Stubbornness is a natural vice. Steadfastness is a gracious quality. Stubbornness is stiff-necked, ungovernable, revolting behavior. My way or the highway. Hard-heartedness. Whereas steadfastness is consistency towards the greater good. Consistency. So friends, what the psalmist is saying here, it's not just about gaining knowledge. It's about worship, having a heart that hopes in God. It is not just about preaching the word or listening to the word. Worship is not just about music and singing. It is about a heart inclined to God. Not for two to three hours on Sunday, but a heart that has been so newly changed and transformed, it is inclined to Him all the day, every day. Verse 9 says here as an illustration and it's the only one we're going to look at the whole chapter is an illustration of this but it mentions the tribe of ephraim the most powerful of the ten tribes in the north after the nation split ephraim was the head of the northern kingdom and they were guilty of rebellion you see they were well equipped and well furnished they had the best weapons of the nation 
but they failed to lead in faith and courage when it was needed most. They turned back from God. They retreated from God's word, from obedience to his law. They acted traitorously, cowardly, dangerously, disastrously, dishonorably in their words and in their lives. Did they still worship the Lord publicly? Yeah, they still had sacrifices and altars. But they had turned in their hearts from what mattered so much more. My friends, it's interesting. Ephraim is kind of like American Christians. Because like Ephraim was more equipped than any of the other tribes, so are we today. But before any other generation, the 2014 church in America has more opportunity, but to whom much is given, much is required. We have church buildings, Bibles freely available via audio, via phones, internet, computer, in print galore. We have study books. We have commentaries. We have biblical preaching. We have community groups. We have the ability to have instant communication with other believers in hard times. And yet I say to you today, just because we have all these privileges does not mean we really understand worship. In fact, verses 10 and 11 say very solemnly, they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. How sad it is that they chose sin over a savior. They neglected and rejected and forgot about God. The vows they had made were broken. The promises they had made they betrayed. Idols were set up. The living God was forsaken. And they acted like everyone else around them. The works that followed them were works of judgment because they refused to follow the work of God. My friend, someone once wisely said these words, and I want you to hear them today. A hypocrite is a person who acts differently on Sunday morning. We usually think of hypocrisy as someone who acts differently throughout the week. But the truth is, a hypocrite is someone who acts differently on Sunday morning. What they do Monday through Saturday is who they really are. I want you to understand today, as we begin this new series, that as a church family, we need to know worship. We need to get worship and how it works, not just on Sunday morning from 1030 to 12. We need to know how worship works Monday through Saturday. So many of us look at worship as a checklist that happens on Sunday morning. And because of this, we are not very good worshipers at all. People are constantly complaining in churches across the country. Here are a few of them. I think I've heard them just a few too many times. The service is too long. There is too much music. There is too little music. The music is too loud. The music is too quiet. The preaching is too short. The preaching is too loud, long. We need fancy lights. Fancy lights on the stage are blasphemous. We should sing out of books. We should sing off screens. There are too many distractions. We can't sit still for an hour, even though we watch football for three. Um, up and down we go, interrupting others with papers crinkling, doors banging, cell phones ringing. We need to use the bathroom, and some of you, uh, two, three, four, five times in one service. I don't think you're going to the bathroom. Some of us feel children should not be allowed in the church. They're a nuisance and distraction. Others, they should play games and whatever else keeps them quiet. The old adage I was told as a kid, be seen and not heard, right? And who knows that one? Seen and not heard. Yeah, we, we've lived that one. Um, I'm still dealing with self-esteem problems because of that one, right? <laughs> Some use Sunday to catch up on their sleep. And I want to know what in the world you do each night. That you have to snore for an hour and a half on Sunday morning, right? I mean, we have all these, these complaints about worship. And I hear them and I get them. And I want to say that proves to us we have no idea what we're talking about when we use the word worship. We have absolutely no idea. I want to hear you to hear a quote from Brian Chappelle who was a longtime president of a seminary. This is powerful. He says, God invites us by his word to join the worship of the ages and the worship of angels in heaven. God does not simply invite us to a party of friends. He has not invited us to a lecture on religion. He has not invited us to a concert or a concert of sacred music. He invites us into the presence of the king of the universe before whom all creation will bow and for whom all heaven now sings. 
None of that stuff I said earlier has anything to do with worship. And if that's what your complaints are, I want to help you the next few weeks. And I don't fault you because it's not your fault that you misunderstand worship. It's the church's fault for not modeling it. We want to do better at that. I want to tell you, I'm not upset with you. I want to help you to understand what worship is, what it means to be in the presence of God Monday through Saturday. I say it again. We are doing this series this for this reason. We worship poorly on Sunday because we worship poorly Monday through Saturday. And I want you to hear from God and have joy in Christ like never before. Let me ask you a question. What sports team would play good on game day if they did not practice? If you just showed up to the games and the team never came together and practiced, it would be a blowout. It would be all misery. It would be depressing. One loss after another. Selfish arguing and bickering. What sports team would ever make it to the championship if they did not practice during the week, right? I want you to think about it this way. Households, families, married couples, single men, single women, children, single parents. I want to help you to know how to worship throughout the week so Sunday is a greater day. But I also want to help you how to learn how to worship throughout the week because it is most important when it comes to knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. It is transforming. It, is, it will make you weep daily to think about God's presence and his love and his grace that you are not alone. You're not going through this on your own if you know Christ. You don't have to do this on your own. It is misery to do life by yourself. Oh, that you would know that. Turn to Psalms chapter 16, please. We start today. That was the introduction. You might be scared, but the sermon's not going to be a lot longer than the introduction was. Psalms chapter 16. Today is a home where worship happens. A home where worship happens. As you're turning there, I want to ask you, how are we doing with Psalm 78? How are we doing with our children? How are our children doing learning about God? How is the next generation following God? One of the, the hardest things a church has to face from time to time is the question, what is the next generation looking like? What are the next leaders going to look like? What are we doing to invest in them? When I came to Klondike, the hardest thing, the most discouraging thing when I came here was there were no children present. We would go Sunday after Sunday and there were none here. That was heartbreaking. What was worse than that was there was like two generations just missing from the church. We had none of them. Something had went wrong and it was not just here. It's in most Southern Baptist churches in our county. There's generations that are just missing. I'm not saying that to be mean. To be indifferent, I've lived through it. If anyone understands it, I understand how hard it is to be the church missing generations. And we have to ask the question, why is that? Why are they missing in so many places? Are we doing Psalm 78? Are we having families that worship, that pass on the truth of God to the next generation? Listen to this, friends. As you're turning to Psalm 16, one survey from the North American Mission Board of the SBC said that 88% of youth that live, that grow up in the church will leave the church once they finish high school in the last generation, 88%. George Barna, who's a researcher, his statistics are slightly better. When teenagers were asked to estimate the likelihood they will continue to participate in church life once they are living on their own, the, level, the levels dipped precipitously to only about one out of every three teens said they would ever expect to go back to church after they were done youth group in high school. One out of three. Lifeway research data shows that about 70% of young adults who indicated they attended church regularly during high school dropped out of high school in the last generation. In other words, something has gone terribly wrong. They were given knowledge, maybe, but I think we gave them a lot of entertainment. I think we gave them a lot of shallow gospels, and I think we did not give them worship. And so they had nothing to come back to when they were on their own. Look at Psalm 16, verse 11. This verse is so powerful. The psalmist says here, you make known to me the path of life. God is the one who is a path for our lives. He reveals us who we are and where we go. 
But then listen to this. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, O Lord, there are pleasures forevermore. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And yet most of us go Monday through Saturday, and when we pray, if we pray, we feel like our prayers hit the ceiling. We feel like we're alone. We're doing this by ourselves. We feel no power. We don't feel the unction of the Holy Spirit. We don't hear, feel the sovereign hand of God guiding us and directing our path. My friends, our greatest joy, according to Scripture, is to be in the presence of our Heavenly Father, to have conversation with Him, to engage with Him, to hear from Him. Worship is simply being in the presence of God and seeing God for who He is and seeing us for who we are. My friends, when we read this verse, we realize that to be in God's presence is to hear from Him in the Scriptures, to fellowship with Him in prayer, to enjoy Him in praise and celebration. The greatest joy to be found in our lives is to be found in the presence of God. It is to be found walking Monday through Saturday as if God is with you. And that, as the Psalms say, God is for you. My friends, why wouldn't we want to share with the people that we love the most, especially those in our homes, worship. If this is what it's all about, the presence of God, why would we not make that a priority Monday through Saturday, just like we do on Sunday, hopefully? I want to demonstrate for a few minutes before we get very practical, not from pragmatic approaches, not from my personal opinion, not from what the church growth gurus have said the last 50 years, but what God's word says about worship and households and families. I want to demonstrate it with seven points this morning. I just want you to listen. If you're taking notes, you can write the passages down. They will be helpful to you later. Number one, during the days of Moses. Deuteronomy 31, verses 12 and 13. Deuteronomy 31, 12 and 13. Assemble the people, men, women, your little ones, and the sojourner. That would be the visitors in your towns that they may hear and, and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the works of his law and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. Who's called to worship? Men, women, children, and even strangers that we don't know are supposed to be called to worship. Number two, when Israel celebrates the feast of the Lord, the law requires them to worship God, not just as adults, but as families. Here, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 7 and 12. You shall eat before the Lord your God. You shall rejoice, you and your household, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You will rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons, and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, even the Levites in your town, since he has no inheritance of his own. Everyone in the home, even guests in your home, are called to come and worship the Lord together. Number three, Joel chapter 2, verse 16. The prophet Joel tells us who should be called to gather together to worship the Lord. Joel 2, 16, gather the people together, consecrate or make holy the congregation. Assemble the elders, those who are older. Assemble the children, even the nursing infants should come to the Lord. Number four, when Jesus taught, children were present. Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. Matthew chapter 19, verse 13. Jesus calling to him a child, put them in the midst of them. Children were brought to him, and he laid his hands on them, and he prayed over them. Number five, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Remember, when the New Testament was written, these letters, often called epistles, that just means letters, were written to local churches to be read aloud in the church. They would gather the whole body of the church, and they would read the letter because the families came together. They worshiped in homes. And as they did this, just let me read one of them to you, Ephesians 6. All of a sudden, Paul breaks out in the letter and he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, 
This is the first commandment with the promise that it would go well with you and you would live long in the land. And then he talks to fathers and then he talks to servants. In other words, as they were worshiping together as the church and they were reading, he expected the children to be present in the worship. That's also seen in other spots in the New Testament as well. Number six, on a missionary journey, Acts chapter 21, verse 5, we are told all the disciples and their wives and their children joined the apostles and prayed together on the beach covenantally as a family, as families making up one family, the church, before they left. Lastly, Jesus said, number seven, Luke 18, verse 16, that no parent, should discourage bringing young children to worship him. Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. From these seven points, I want to say two very big statements today that I think are vitally important. Number one, and I want to teach these because I haven't taught them in years, and I realize thinking about these things that half the church wasn't here when I taught these last. And so listen, if this is new for you, just listen and ask God to help you with this. Number one, the idea of worship being segregated is foreign to the Bible. I am a anti-segregation guy all the way around because I think the Bible is. What I mean by that is I think all peoples, all ethnicities should come together and worship. The church should look like the city. So all the different people groups that live in the city should be represented in the church. Amen. Number two, I think all generations should be represented in the church. Intergenerational worship because that's all you see in the Bible. The idea of a separate children's church or a teenager's church or a super church or whatever is foreign to what you read in the scriptures. Now, I am not angry or opposed with churches that do these things. I just say to you this. For 1,950 plus years, there was no such thing in the church of Jesus Christ. That was a very new thing that developed just a few generations back. And I don't think it's the only cause, but one of the big reasons why you have such a dropout rate of so many that are not following in the faith of their parents is because they never worshiped with their families together. They were separated all the time. Now, look, I have taught children's church under duress many years ago in my first ministry assignment full time. I was forced to do it for two years. And as an ordained pastor, I taught the kids the word of God and I did my best. But there was something missing. And this is what it was. I was not their pastor. The pastor was in the congregation preaching. Number two, I was not their father and I was not their mother. And there is something powerful because you can do what I can never do. I am your child's pastor, but you're their parents first and foremost. And they, they honor you and they love you and they respect you. And you sometimes forget the amazing power God has given you to influence them for the good of their lives. My friends, if you don't have deacons, you don't have elders, and you don't have the generations present, it does not look like the New Testament and then on top of it, usually what happens in children's church, not always, there are exceptions. We tried hard when I was forced to teach one for two years. We tried hard to make it exceptionally well done. But I will say the majority time, there's volunteers who staff it, who are underprepared, who basically entertain children and keep them busy for an hour and a half and just try not to get their hair pulled out of their head by the end of the time. If you've been in children's church, you probably would agree with me on this. Very few churches do that very well. Now, there are exceptions, and I'm thankful for the exceptions. I'm just telling you the truth. But that's really not the point. The point is this. Look, we've got tons of children's activities and classes. We have Sunday school, community groups, a weekly nursery, youth groups on Wednesday night, special events throughout the year from VBS to block parties. But when it comes to worship, worship is about the family, the whole family coming together to worship God. And this is what God has called us to in his word. And there's power in doing things God's way. We segregate and separate our families all the time in life. And I say to you, can we just not separate them in church? But can we also show respect to one another's families in church? And respect one another with the volume of noise. Respect one another with discipline. Respect one another by making this not something to get through, but something that we cherish and love. 
So doors aren't banging nonstop. So papers aren't being torn. So cell phones don't go off. So instead, we are trying to teach our children that this is serious. And it's okay when kids scream. I love to hear a child scream in church. I'm the weird pastor that enjoys that. It means someone's alive in the building, right? But incessant screaming for more than 30 seconds is very bad. And then my temper meter goes from happy to hot because 30 seconds later, no one knows what's going on, right? And that's why we have a cry room. Show respect. But come together as a family. Children seeing mom and dad bow their heads in fervent prayer. Seeing mom and dad sing praise to God with joy in their faces. Opening the Bible and listen hungrily to the word. Catching the spirit of their parents meeting the living God is a greater sermon than anything I do each week. It is a greater sermon for them. My friends, one question I'm asked all the time is why your church doesn't have a children's church on Sunday morning for the little children? And when asked that question, I typically respond, well, why do you have a children's church? You want to ask me why we don't? Let me ask you why you do. Show me it in the Bible. Because I believe Scripture says there's power in families coming together. And this is what I think has really happened. If kids learn at an early age it's acceptable in the house of God to separate themselves from the adults, when they become adults, they will continue to separate themselves from the adults. And that's what the statistics show. The whole idea of segregating worship by age developed the last 50 years, give or take a few, but for the 2,000 years of Christ's one true, holy, apostolic church, this was not the case. Families worship together. My friends, parents, be jealous to model for your children the tremendous value that you put on reverencing God. I love the parents of our church. And I say to you, you be the leader. You show the children. It's not always easy. There's nothing harder. We have two. I know how hard it is. And I'm disadvantaged from all of you. I don't get to sit with my kids and yell at them each week. You get to. We know it's hard, but it pays off. Trust me. Think of football. Since we're in the South, think of college football. I'm going to help you to get this via illustration. Some Christians are very determined to have their children fans of the college they root for. And I'm just saying to you, show that same determination to show your children how to be followers of Jesus. Think about it this way. You watch the games with your children. You buy your children your team's t-shirt. You take your kids to the games on those special occasions. What would you say? Our whole family, if you're an Alabama fan, sorry if you're not, is going to Bryant-Denny Stadium to watch the Tide play. We're all going as a family. Imagine this. You get there, and then you take your kids outside of the stadium to go downstairs to a separate room to watch rec league football while you go back into the stadium to watch the real game. Let me ask you a question. How stupid does that sound? Right? It's not a family thing anymore. And they're watching something that's not so exciting, let's be honest. And you're watching the real deal. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute, that's not quite true because at least they'll be contained and they'll know what's going on. Well, fine, fair enough. But the truth is, if you go to Bryant-Denny Stadium, unless you got a lot of money, everyone in the field looks like ants anyhow, right? It's not exactly really entertaining for kids to watch football live way up high in the nosebleeds, is it? So I say to you this. My kids hated going to watch the Wahoos play baseball the first five or six times I took them. They wanted the Kindle. They wanted the phone. They wanted to go eat and go eat again because they were bored. It wasn't very exciting. But you know what happened? After going constantly with them and sitting and explaining the game to them patiently, and it was not easy the first two years of the seasons, but after about two years of going to games, guess what? My kids want to go to the Wahoos anytime and every time there's tickets available. And they're not athletes, either one of them. You can ask them. But they love it. Why? Because we persevered together as a family and it paid off. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, the faith of a parent will establish covenant holiness and privilege and responsibility in their children. So look, worship is about being in the presence of God, and you can do this all week long. You don't have to just do it here on Sunday morning. But what I say to you is we don't worship well on Sunday because we're not doing it well Monday through Saturday. So here's what I want us to do at the end. Here's how we wrap this up. I want you to think about your home for a minute. I believe this statement, as your home goes, so goes the church, and so goes the nation. Family worship, worship in the home, is probably the most decisive factor to see how the home goes.
And most of us, when we worship at home, it's a very superficial exercise of praying as fast as you can so you can get into dinner, right? That's usually what it is. I read an article from the BBC that said that, quote, conversation between family members has degenerated into an indistinguishable series of monosyllabic grunts, unquote. That's pretty true. We're not very good anymore at this, are we? How can we pass the Christian faith on without worshiping together as a household regularly and consistently? So you say, well, I don't have the traditional household. Well, just think for a minute. A home where worship happens means if you're a believer, you worship in your home. And you worship with anyone who's willing to worship with you. And if you're a leader and you have little kids, you force them to worship with you because they will grow to love it. Think about it this way. We have called this devotions, daily bread, quiet time, family altar, family worship, Bible reading, whatever. I'm not concerned about what you call it. I'm concerned that you do it and you do it with everyone who's willing in your home. Now, this isn't complex. It doesn't require a doctorate, ordination, or an extended period of growth spiritually. It is a simple gathering of those under the same roof for a time to worship God together. It may be a single mother and her two children, two sisters living together, a mom and dad and their eight children, a single person living by themselves in their home. It could be a husband and wife, a single dad with three children, a family of husband, wife, uh, an in-law, and four children. It could be a uh, home where there's one spouse who's a Christian and one who's not, and children that are on their way. And maybe it's just the one spouse who's a believer in the children. I don't say that it's always going to look perfect, but the point is, do you come together and worship God? Now, again, I don't mean to have a formal worship service for an hour and a half. I don't mean that. But what I do mean is, do you worship together Monday through Saturday? You say, give me some understanding, Pastor. So let me do this in the last couple minutes. When? When would you come together as a family? Well, you could maybe come together before bedtime. That works best in our family, and that's when we do it. You could come together in the morning if everyone's a morning person in your house. If they're not, that might not be a good idea. You can come together at the kitchen table. Just, if you do that, do it after you eat. If you do it before you eat, I promise you it'll be way too quick because no, and mom will be angry if the food gets cold, right? But afterwards, before you start, leave the phone in the other room. Turn the TV, the radio, and the computer off. Your family must understand worship is the most important activity of the day and should not be interrupted by anything else. How long? It might be three to five minutes. It might be ten minutes. If you preach a sermon, you're full of yourself. Don't do it. It might be five minutes. It might be ten minutes. What does it involve? What does this mean? How do you worship together at home so that you can worship in such a more wonderful way at church on Sunday. So let me give you two acronyms and we're done. And they're short. The first one is pray. You gotta pray together as a family. Whoever wants to come together as a family, we're called in the Bible in those seven points I gave you to, to worship God together, pray together. Pray stands for this. It stands for praise first, the P. Repentance second. Ask third. Yield last. Praise. This is what you do. If you're the leader of the time of family worship, this is what you do. You get everyone together and you say, what are we thanking God for today? I ask these questions in my small group. What are we celebrating? What are we giving thanks for? What are we praising for? Simple question that you can ask your family. If you have little kids, they love to talk and tell you. And they'll, they'll surprise you with some of the things they say. What am I thanking God for today? Thank the Lord for food and drink, for his mercy, for spiritual opportunities, for answered prayer, for health, for deliverance from evil. Sometimes your kids will blow you away with the things they're thankful for, but give them the opportunity to say it. Secondly, repentance. What do we need to ask God for forgiveness for today? Like when your teacher called me from school. Or when I lost my temper at work. Let me tell you, leaders of the home, your, parents, your kids will learn more from you when you're vulnerable about your own weaknesses. They will learn more from you when you are vulnerable. So, when dad, a.k.a. Josh Walnifer, loses his temper on his children and reams them out because they were fighting again, and we come together for family worship, dad, a.k.a. me, has to eat humble pie and apologize to him and tell him that I was not right in what I did. You know, they learn more from that than if I preach to him a sermon each week about 
not being, being angry and sinning not. They get that. We confess our sins together. We repent as a family. You come together, whatever the weaknesses are, and you just say, we've messed up. So God, we want you to help us and forgive us. A.W. Pink said, it is not the sins of a Christian. It's his unconfessed sins which choke the channel of blessing and cause so many to miss God's best. Number three, we say, hey, what do we want to pray about? Ask. What are some things we want to pray about? If you have little kids, they're going to pray that we don't have any bad dreams tonight. And they're going to probably pray for a friend at school or their teacher. And they might pray for family members who's sick. And you parents give them some requests to pray about. Pray for your church, your friends, your school, your city. Pray for people that don't know Jesus as Lord in your lives. We pray every week in our family for a father-in-law who needs Christ, for his wife, for my wife's half-sister. We pray for my brother every night in our home. They need Jesus as Savior, and we pray for him together. And for other people in our church, we pray together about these things. Then last, the why. Yield. Thy will be done. Submit and ask God to work in your lives as Lord. Thomas Brooks says, A family without prayer is like a house without a roof, open and exposed to all the storms of heaven. You don't have to pray long, eloquent prayers, but incorporate those, those elements. Praise and repentance and ask and thanksgiving and yield. God, your will be done in our home. And you know what? Have your kids pray. Have different people pray. And it doesn't have to be the same person each night. Your kids' prayers might be like 13 seconds long. But they might surprise you one day and belt out a two-minute long one. And it's worth it. And sometimes they might pray for you, Mom, or you, Dad, and it will crush your heart. And you will be closer to God at that minute than you've ever been in your whole life when they pray for you. It happens. The last acronym is REAP. REAP. Not necessarily in this order. Read, examine, apply, and pray. By the way, I've typed all these things out and put them in your bulletin to help you. Reap. Deuteronomy 6. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. J.C. Ryle says, fill their minds with scripture. Let the word dwell in them richly. Give them the Bible, the whole Bible, even while they are young. Jesus said, it's written, you should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. So first you read the R. Read the Word of God. Read a psalm every day. I recommend read a psalm every day as a family. Maybe read one proverb, just one verse from the Proverbs every day. Read a chapter in the Gospels, especially if you're new to reading the Bible. Just read a chapter. Or maybe just read a section. Some of our modern Bibles have sections designated. Read a section from the Gospels every day. Number two, examine the Word of God together. All you simply ask is this question. What does this teach us about God? Jesus parted uh, or in the Old Testament, God, through Moses, parted the waters. It shows us that God is in control over nature, that God is powerful, that God is mighty to answer our prayers. When we're about to be overwhelmed by Pharaoh's army, God can come and deliver us, children. That's just what this teaches us about God. Second, third, apply the word of God together. What does this teach us about ourselves? Well, it teaches us that we are weak and on our own. Pharaoh's army would have crushed us, but if we trust in God, God will answer our prayers. He will intervene. Even when we grumble and complain, he's faithful to come and save us. How, so those are the questions you ask your kids. What does it teach us about God? What does it teach us about ourselves? And then you pray together. You pray together and you ask for God to apply those words to your hearts. You pray a blessing over your family as you close. My friends, you don't have to do it in this order, but you got to do it. It could be five minutes, but five minutes a day cumulatively will change your family and your Sundays forever. Have your children read if they're old enough to read. Don't be the, the, the reading hog. Let them read the Bible and enjoy it. Whoever's in your home, different people, mom read, dad read, your spouse read, whatever. Whoever makes up your home, different people, get them involved. Everyone should be involved in this. I want to end with this quote. Think about this. If your children are in your home for 18 years, you have 6,570 occasions, that's six days a week, forgetting Sunday, for family worship. If you read a chapter a day, you will complete the Bible four and a half times in 18 years. Every day, they will pray for others. Think of this in terms of the long view. What is the impact cumulatively of 15 minutes of this each day, after day, week after week, month after month, year after year for 18 years? At the rate of six days a week, excluding Sundays, you would spend an hour and a half 
a week in family worship, the length of a long Bible study or service. 78 hours a year, the length of the meeting hours of seven weekend retreat, retreats. 1,404 hours over the course of 18 years, the length of the church having 40 week uh, of, a, of a church meeting, 40 week long summer camps, assuming that 30 hours in an average week long camp happen. When you establish your priorities, think in terms of the cumulative effect of this upon your children. My friends, I can't afford not to give God and his word priority in my family. I can't afford not to. When you are on your deathbed one day, you will not regret that you didn't watch every football game. You will not regret that you didn't work 60 hours instead of 50. You will not regret that you spent more time on Facebook or the internet. But you will regret if you didn't pray with your children. You will regret if you didn't read together as a family or as you individually. And Jesus Christ has come to change our lives forever. Let's worship him because he deserves it because he's worthy. Let's pray and then we're going to take the Lord's table. Father. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.